This red box is going to change the Nintendo Switch market forever, and after today, it will never be the same. Hey guys, Taki here. Today, we have a huge video. As I stated in my MIG Switch video, I think there's a high chance that this video is going to get taken down, but I hope that Nintendo doesn't because even if you don't want to buy this thing at all and you have no interest in it or this card, you need to be informed about it because its existence can impact every Nintendo Switch owner. And if you're not informed about what it is and what it does, there are some potential negative consequences that can come out of it. So in this video, I'm gonna present information that I think both sides need to know about this. People that are interested in getting this, and also the people that want to know how they're going to have to navigate the landscape now that both of these exist. Anyway, this is the MIG Switch Dumper. It's a small red box with a Type-C port on one end and a Nintendo Switch cartridge slot on the other. And if I just get a cart for this, it clicks into place just like it does on a Switch. Without opening it up, I'm assuming some of the things that were on the PCB for this are also on this PCB because the update files are the same. If you want to wrap your head around this, think of this as if it were an SD card reader. If you connect this to a computer with a cartridge inserted, the computer would be able to read all of the files you would need to essentially create a clone of it with the hardware solution in the MIG switch. These are things that were usually used for emulators, but there's a lot of extra identification that is only required when you want to do a one-to-one -one clone of a card that can then go online. That's the most important part of this entire thing, but we've got to see how it works. Let's get a computer to see what happens when we plug this in. For our PC, we're going to go with the Nintendo Switch. Obviously, this can be used in a lot of things, but I figured since Nintendo's already going to be super angry that I'm doing a video on the dumper, why not make matters worse for myself by showing an operating system that they don't even want you to be able to run? So anyway, we have this dumper connected to this USB cable. There's no cart in it right now, we're just going to start by connecting the other end of this cable to the Nintendo Switch. Once that happens, the activity light is going to go on inside the dumper, and if I put my hand here, you can see that the activity light is solid red to show that it's active. At the top of the screen, we have a notification that we've connected to a drive called Game Cart, and if we press on that, we can view what is on the dumper. So far, it looks like a flash drive. Now the interesting thing about this is that in the properties it shows as a 275 gigabyte drive. It also says that it has half a gig of free storage. I don't believe this thing has that much space and we'll check on that later when we do a teardown. I just think it's very interesting that they've done this. As you can see, it says that we're at 99% capacity with the drive almost full. Inside the drive, we have a system folder. In there, we have a single update.s2 file. If you recall from my MIG switch video, that's the update package. They only have one update package online for both, so I would be shocked if these do not share the same PCB components. If we just press on that file, we can see that this is just basically under 300 kilobytes. I'll go over the update process later in this video. As you can see right now, we don't have anything. This just works as a flash drive. If I disconnect it, that goes away. If I plug it back in, it reconnects as a USB drive. And I think everybody watching this video has a pretty good understanding of how a flash drive works so we can move on. This is where things get spicy. Finding a game that I can test with this. Most of the games that I have are things that I know would cause ninjas to kick in my windows, so I'm going to go with Minecraft. I have two of them here, and I'm going to be upfront about what I'm doing in this video. If I copy any files off this dumper, they will not exist after the camera shuts off. This is not a game that I need to dump. So let's take one of our two Minecraft cartridges, and then we're just going to put it into our little red box, and then we're going to connect it to see what happens. So the dumper disconnects, the activity light goes back on, and then our game card shows back up. The difference this time is that we now have a new folder. I want to go into the properties now to see what it says for our capacity. It still says that we have the same amount of free space, but now it shows that we have a bunch of items that are totaling over 900 megabytes. If I go inside the new folder, you can see all of the files that you would need to be able to clone this card on the MIG switch. If we look at those, we have the ROM file, which is pretty small, things considered, at less than a gig. We also have the card ID set, the card UID, the ROM certificate, and the ROM initial data. As far as I know, this file is the only one that is unique for every single cartridge. It's unique to this Minecraft cartridge. If I did a dump of this and I analyzed that certificate file and then I dumped this Minecraft right here, those two files should be different. But the initial data, the card UID, the card ID set, and the ROM should all be identical between the two of them. Only the ROM certificate should be different. What I want you to kind of internalize is just how easy it was for me to connect this to my Switch to have full access to all of these files. Now I could make a one-to-one -one backup of this card. If I did that, do I even need the real cartridge anymore? No. I have enough files here to make an exact clone of this game and use it how I see fit. That's kind of the danger of these two products. Now, does it work? 
And the answer to that question is yes. And it even works in the way that it's connected right now. We don't even need to copy these files over to be able to use them. If I open up He Who Shall Not Be Named, you can see that it identifies Minecraft as a valid game. A couple of things here. The files that are currently in use to allow this to happen come from this Nintendo Switch. I know that Nintendo doesn't care about that distinction, but I'm just trying to do this as above board as possible. If we press on that game, you can see that the game will start to launch and the activity light will change. Now we have my OLED Switch using its own files to decrypt this game running from an external card reader. It's so strange that this is now possible. It's also weird that someone would never even need to dump their games to be able to use them. And I believe you can do this across all platforms that have a USB port and an emulator. Anyway, here's Minecraft running on the Switch through emulation. I've played a lot of Minecraft on the Switch, and the most disappointing thing about seeing this running in the way that I have it here is that it even runs better than it does under the official system. That is just sad. You should not be able to get an improved gaming experience by running an emulator that emulates the device that you are using to run the emulator. I'm just gonna show you in just a second, but if this was on the stock system, I would see a ton of pop-in as the game loads other parts of the world, but it's running way better than it should via emulation. Here's the same game under the stock OS, and you can see exactly what I'm talking about. This isn't even as bad as it can get because it's possible to get a de facto loading screen while you wait for the next chunk to load in. But I digress. We have one thing left to cover when it comes to this before we start talking about some of the meat of this video, and that is updating it. Let's go over to the MIG Switch website. We can see that the cartridge and the dumper share a binary file. I've already gone ahead and grabbed the latest one. It shows up as an 80 kilobyte file. I'm gonna copy this file, and then I'll go inside that system folder to paste it in place overwriting the one that was already there. Now you can see that our file in this folder is only 80 kilobytes. We're going to disconnect this and then reconnect it. And now when we go back in there, you can see that our file is back to being 272 kilobytes. So that's how we do the update process on this. I think the next thing that people want to see is the PCB. Before doing that, I'm going to open up the MIG switch card. As a recap, they etched out the top of the two of these, but I was able to identify that one of these chips was an ESP32, which is a very cheap microcontroller, and the other was a small FPGA from Lattice. Both of these should be inside the MIG switch dumper. All right, let's disconnect the USB cable to start opening this up. With the thing open, we can see that they did not etch off the labels, so we can get a closer look at them after we remove the remaining screws. And here we go. This is the MIG switch dumper. And as you'll notice, we have some familiar parts that we already talked about. Here's the ESP32, which is going to fill the role of handling I.O. and updating the FPGA. And if we flip this over, here's our Lattice FPGA. This should be the chip that is responsible for interfacing with this card to be able to rip off the data. Essentially, it's decrypting the game files in the same way that you do that on a hacked switch. And if we just get our MIG switch, we can see this chip is the Lattice chip, and this one is the ESP32. Beyond that, we just have two other chips along with some resistors and fuses. There's not a whole lot going on here. We do have this cartridge slot, and I guess this is just something that exists as an aftermarket part on the repair market for switches, so they were just able to get it for this product. Anyway, here's the back. It's a very simple piece of kit, and this is something that shouldn't be too complicated given what they have on this. And as a side, I might leave the case off this because I think the bare board looks a lot better than the red box. But that's the whole thing. For this last big section, I want to talk about the impact of this. Now that both of these products exist, I feel like I can fully outline all of the issues that this presents. So let's get one thing clear before we get started. It was possible to dump games before this existed, and it'll be possible to dump them after. The big difference is in what is being dumped. If you dump a Switch game on a modded Switch, you would usually just have the ROM file here and that would allow you to play the game on an emulator or on a modded Switch by running the game from an SD card. From Nintendo's side, they could ban your Switch if you were to ever play that game with your Switch connected to the internet. That is why people with modded Switches usually only play pirated games on their emulated system with all of the telemetry disabled. With this tool, we now have a use for other card contents that can be dumped. And the one that's important here is that certificate file because that's the unique file for this exact cartridge. Before this existed, there was never a real use for those files, and even though people could have dumped those files with a modded switch in the past, there was nothing they could really do with them. Now there is. I want to be upfront about this with you. After I did my last video, I said I was going to go out and buy a ton of Switch games that I had on my wish list. I bought about 15 games or so after I released my last video. These aren't all of them, but they were games that I've been holding off on buying. Just like with the Nintendo Switch consoles that I own, 
I buy a mix of new and used games. If there's a game that I really want to play on release, then I will buy that game sealed. That would be something like Tears of the Kingdom or Super Mario RPG. I bought those games on release because I wanted to experience them when they were new. For other games that are older that I never got to experience, I would just buy those games used and before these things existed, I never needed to worry about whether or not somebody had cloned any unique files that could potentially get me screwed without me knowing. To be able to describe this situation that we're in now, I'm going to use Minecraft for this and I'm going to use it for a few reasons that will hopefully make sense to you. I have two copies of this. One is inside here and the other is on the table. Let's say that I wanted to buy a third copy of Minecraft and I didn't want to buy it brand new. If I wanted to buy this game now, and this is like typically a game that you want to use online, that you could use online, I now need to worry about whether or not there is a certificate file from the game that I'm buying that has already been dumped on the internet or that somebody has made a copy of that they're now running from a MIG switch. That's one worry that I have to have. And if you think that people aren't going to do this, you are sorely mistaken because there's a lot of discussion already from people that want to go out and buy new Switch games just to dump them before returning them to the store after they get the files that they need. If those people go online with their clone and you go online with your game, that certificate file will go to Nintendo and they can see that there are two consoles or more using the same unique ID. Nintendo hasn't said how they're going to handle this situation, but they can't just sit back because this will cause a lot of lost revenue for them. I wish that they would say something because this is not a good situation for Nintendo Switch owners to be in. So now in this situation, if I want to buy this thing, I have to ask the seller, have you dumped this game? And I have to hope that they will be honest with me. Now, if they were the original owner of the game, it's easier to track that chain of custody because I just have to ask one person. But if many people have owned the same game, that's way too risky. Because now you have to hope that multiple people didn't clone a cert file while they had their hands on the game that you now own. Now that's just if someone wants to use the game on the MIG Switch. If you're a Switch owner, it's not going to come as a surprise that used prices on Switch games are kind of high. The official price for new games is also kind of high. There is now a huge incentive for people to take a game that has a high resale value and just clone it with a fake cart using the hardware solution that now exists with the MIG Switch design. If people have the ability to turn out near identical clones of official games, then the entire used market just becomes super shady. Let's just take these two games for example. These are the used prices for Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom where I live. As you can see, they aren't that cheap, especially for a game as old as Breath of the Wild. If we take the hardware and the MIG Switch as an example, we have an FPGA that's going to set you back around 2 to $3 in volume, as well as an ESP32 that can go between 2 to $4 depending on the model. If we include all of the passive components on this board and take into account the cost to get this thing fabricated, you're looking at a $7 PCB. You could then add some storage on the board, get a good sticker and a nice shell to have a full clone. Now when you want to buy something from the secondhand market, it would be very difficult for you to know at a glance if you're buying an authentic Switch game because they could do a very good job and you won't know unless you ever open it up. That's going to be a huge problem going forward because now you're going to have to worry about counterfeits and that's something that we never needed to worry about for the entire lifespan of the Nintendo Switch. So I just presented two situations to you. One where there's an incentive for people to now clone cartridges of games with a high resale value, but they could even do this for a current release. That's going to have a huge impact on the entire Switch ecosystem. The cynical side of this is, well, Nintendo is just going to be happy about this because it will blow up the used game market and cause people to only buy new games. I don't know if I believe that. Going forward, I'm going to have to get used to asking sellers if they've ever dumped the files from the games they're trying to sell now that both of these exist. I think that fully explains this title. Anyway, that's it for this review of the MIG Switch Dumper. It does exactly what it sets out to do, but it does have some downsides. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see another, take a look at my big video on the Nintendo Switch in 2024. Happy gaming everyone, Taki out.